Hello, this is Reb Brad, and you're listening to the Soccer Chaplains United podcast from the Touchline. This week is part two of a four-part series. It's a longer interview. We've broken down into some smaller pieces, and I'm really pleased to have special guest with me, Rod Underwood. Rod is a former pro player, currently head coach of Chattanooga FC, a team playing in NISA, the National Independent Soccer Association, a league here in the U.S. Chattanooga just won the NISA Independent Cup a few weeks ago, and the team's been on a tear ever since. Rod serves on the Soccer Chaplains United Board of Directors, and a few weeks ago, he shared with the board his personal mission statement that he's written and works to live out in life as a coach and husband and father, and I thought it'd be great to have him on the podcast. Well, this week in part two, Rod talks about his transition from player, pro player, to pro coach, head coach, and where he finds his coaching philosophy, his brotherhood, and where he's learned key aspects of the game. So stay tuned. We kick off part two right after this. a little off foot thinking he's going to go far post not strong enough with his right hand whips that one in far post almost made him in and they have he has the hat trick the second in his career the third of the night the hat trick hero talked about you're not going to be able to sustain that kind of pressure to the corner goes towards the near post and you're the angle and what a goal what a goal some point you you start to change you feel this inclination maybe toward coaching because you were a player coach for a little bit weren't you yeah I mean I I mean I started doing my coaching licenses while I was still playing so by the time I finished playing I already had my a license by the time I was finished playing and and is there a moment where you look back and you go I think I realized at this moment that I love this game and I want to I want to be a coach when I'm done. Is there a specific moment or was it more gradual? Like, hey, I'm going to do these licenses just in case or to have, you know, a job later. Like, what was it for you? Can you think back and describe that? You remember? Well, that? I don't know if it was. I mean, give me an idea. Right. My the first team I ever coached, I was 16 years old. I coached a little U18 at the YMCA, the same YMCA I played at. Right. Okay. <laughs> so I went back. And I coached a little U8, U9 team, and um, it was fun, right? I enjoyed it. Uh, and then, like, you know, and as I grad, as I got older, the YMCA started saying, hey, you want to run after in college, you want to run some soccer camps for us in the summer. So I'd run two or three weeks of soccer camps at the YMCA. And um, and it just, that just, it just built that way, right? And then when I went out to Albuquerque, right, to be fair, that was a way to make more money, like it is now for guys playing at, these lower division teams in America, right? Sure. You know, to make extra money, you would you would uh, coach teams, do some do some private lessons, whatever you could do to make some extra money, right? Um, and so that was you just you just got into it, and then um, it just it just it just seemed like the next step to take. So it wasn't like I'm going to be a coach. It was just the next step to take, and then. Really, once I got into coaching and then um, I was able to go back and coach the team that I had retired from. Right. And so that was just like the, the start mm. of the professional game. Right. Okay. Was that was like. That was like 90 in the in the middle 90s. Um, and yeah, I mean, and the thing is, the team was good. Right. We made it all the way to at that time. They call it like the, we made it to the final six. Right. Um, and then the then I want to say was it the next year the next year or the year after we won the we won the league championship in 97, 97, 98, something like that. Wow. So we won the league championship, and then that was really like wow okay. And then MLS was coming about, and then I started to um, connect with MLS coaches, MLS teams, and at that time, much like you saw a few years back, where all the MLS teams had partnerships with USL teams, right? It was the same thing back back there in the, in the in the middle to late 90s. And you had – you were a farm team from a MLS team, and you'd send players up, they send players down, and if you had the right relationship, then you it would work, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, a lot of things you see today has already been done. <laughs> That's the funny thing. But most people think – because most people are new to the game, 
they don't realize that all those things have been tried and, you know, obviously MLS has just been fantastic and the growth of it. I mean, you know, none of us thought we'd ever see this. People that are my age, we never thought we'd see it look like this. So right. that's just the reality. Nice. Um, so, so but, Rod, uh, we'll, we'll get into Chattanooga FC in a little bit, the team that you're currently head coach for. Um, but, but before we do, I'm kind of aware that, um, you know, there's this thing called a coaching tree. And, and maybe some of our listeners won't know this, but it, it's almost this thing where it's it's like an ancestry tree, right? It's like, here's right. the, the coach that kind of spawned me or or I'm connected into this coach because we share philosophy or, or they kind of birthed me. What coaching tree do you belong to? It, I, I, maybe I'm not getting this right too. Like I've only, I've read a few articles, I've seen a few things, but is there such a thing for you or, or do you attribute, do you connect into someone and you go, I belong to this coach's coaching tree. Like I'm, I'm one of their adherents. I'm one of their followers. I'm, I'm connected into them. I mean, I, I think there is as a player, right? Because, you know, I think like I mentioned, Mr. Gentry, Mr. Clay, my college coach, John Tarr. And we had a guy by the name of Rory Reese who helped John and, um, Roy ultimately went on to coach the U17 national team. I think it was the first team to qualify for the U17 World Cup. And he was our coach. He was our coach for the first year, if I remember. It was the year, first year at Furman. Uh, Welsh fella, really good coach. So I learned a lot from him. But I would say from the professional standpoint, guys that I've had like, you know, probably the most influential guy that I have had contact with in terms of working with or knowing personally is Preki. He really is the way he sees the game is how I've always seen the game, but he helped me to really like organize it and be committed to it without compromise. Mm, okay. And he is a guy that, I mean, just, Fantastic, right? I, I, but I, I remember, to... I remember Preki would literally break guys' ankles because because of his cut and his turn yeah. uh, when he was playing the game. And then yeah. um, he coached. Uh, did you guys coach in in Portland or or Sac Sacramento Republic? We coached in Sacramento together. But Preki Preki coached Chivas USA. He coached Toronto. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if he. I know he coached those two teams. I'm not sure if he. If he coached Kansas City, Kansas City or not, I'm not sure. Not he played there, but I, I know for sure Toronto and Chivas; those were the two teams in MLS that I know for sure. Now he's an assistant with Brian at at Seattle, right? So, um, but and then I spent a lot of time, you know, at at Portland with uh, Caleb Porter. Caleb's another guy. He had a great philosophy at the time. He was really committed to what he what he wanted. So I learned a lot watching Caleb. Sure. Um, okay. But I don't have the I don't have the relationship with Caleb like I have the relationship with Preki. I mean, uh, Preki and I just talked last week, right? So we're always talking. We're always we just became friends, right? And so that really changed it. Um, but I mean, Preki's probably the most influential guy that uh, I've ever worked with. Uh, there's other guys, but I, there's nobody on that level. Sure. But sure. there's there's a lot, lot of coaches, not a lot of just a few coaches, right? The guy that I would say on the international stage that is the guy that is my guy that um, is, is Pep Guardiola. He's like the guy. Oh, for you're me. you're a Pep fan. Oh my gosh. Yeah. My good friend, so, my good friend Brian Schultz, uh, who I hope is listening to this podcast, he he just loves Pep all over the place, and I I give yeah. him. I give him grief about it. So okay, you're you're a Pep fan. All right. Yeah. So he's. I mean him. Bielsa is like also, I mean, anybody in that realm, Bielsa. So really my foundational coaching comes from Renus Mickles, who is called the architect of, that's what we know as the architect. There was a guy that was before him, but Renus Mickles, the Dutch guy, and then Cruyff is right from him. So that's really the foundation for me. And then everyone that comes out of that realm, Preki, Bielsa, I mean, Preki is in that realm. Uh, Pep Guardiola, um, those guys are guys that um, 
that I really like truly enjoy. Um, Mauricio Sari is another guy that's like I really enjoy. But there's other guys like Enchilada. I love his personality. I love how he how he connects with 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 the players. Um, I love Klump's energy. I love his, you know, really before those guys, that the guy that really sort of connects for me, the the Cruyff, Marinus Mickles, is Arsene Wenger when he was at Arsenal. That that's like that's when I really it's like possession football and then everything around that. So that's kind of the that's kind of my sort of belief and just uncompromising way of of doing coaching soccer now now rod you you've mentioned a lot of these guys on the international stage you you've talked about you know just the influence there but when you and i were growing up and we did not have like we didn't know these guys we didn't we didn't have like nbc sports broadcasting premier league games and we like how was it that you got introduced into, or how did, did you just become a lover of the game? And you're like, I'm going to study this. I'm going to study, you know, these things. Like, well, so how did it come? It just, it, it, I remember there were certain things, right? Um, because what, what it's hard to equate, what people understand, like I got a chance to watch the NASL, NASL. Johan Cruyff was in the league at the time. Mm. George Best played in the league. I could go on and on of guys that soccer people know. These are iconic people, yeah. right? Pelé, you know, Franz Beckenbauer, right? Who yeah. played was who played center back for for Germany when they were like the best of the best, right? Uh, so I watched all these guys, um, and then you know. Um, Albuquerque is quite interesting because Albuquerque was a real, and there was this guy by the name. Um, there was a guy there that back in the day when you could, you know, you could only get soccer games on certain days. I just started videotaping, right? All these games. So you could watch Liverpool every once in a while. You could watch Man United. You could, you know, you didn't really get any like Spanish leagues. It was all mostly in the English league. And there was a show that came out on Saturday, Soccer Made in Germany, 30 minute show. And he would, it would highlight, it would be a 30 minute show of a highlight of, um, of games. And I understand what I'm talking, what I'm talking about, right? We had four or five channels on our TV. That was it. And thought so we were to get Soccer Made in Germany, Germany on channel 46. It wasn't, okay. it was just a local TV station. <laughs> So, I mean, literally, I'm talking about growing up when TV went off at 10 o'clock after the news or 11 o'clock after the news, right? Yeah. There was no TV. Oh, man. You know? So. These, these young coaches sort of watch, today, they have so many resources at their hand. Yeah. They just get on the internet. And then, <laughs> it's yeah, crazy. and then I, I just started, then I started buying books, right? I started mm -hmm. buying books. I started watching videos. And then, like, in 94, I recorded every single World Cup game. And I still have – I have every single World Cup game, almost every single World Cup 94 game on videotape. Oh, you've got a stack of VHSs. I'm, I'm sure the family yeah. is like, hey, when are we going to get rid of these, Dad? <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. So that tells you, right, that's how committed I was to, like, the game, right? And then, um, yeah, I mean, that's how, that's how it was. I started buying books, reading, watching video, and – um yeah and then you know really sort of i would say like the modern right so i was very six i we had a good coaching career up until about 2000 and then from about to be fair from about two thousand two thousand and two years I was out of professional soccer for seven. I was just doing youth things. Couldn't get a job. And at that time, it was a funky time because MLS was coming. USL was really low, so they weren't a lot of jobs. Leagues. And then out of the blue, I was the Portland Timbers job came up to be the head coach. Mm. I sent my resume in, um, and um, I didn't get the job. But Gavin Wilkinson, who's like a friend of mine to this day, right? He got the head coaching job. He saw my resume. 
and he invited me for an interview and he offered me the job. Didn't know Gavin from anybody. Wow. wow. Anybody. And so the thing that I have for Gavin is beyond because I kept, so I get to the point, get a job again. I'm going to get back in the game. But every year I was applying. Apply, I never stopped applying. I was, yeah, you showed that perseverance to, to keep applying. Uh, yeah. And, and finally get back in the game. Yeah. And, and, you know, so I can never thank Gavin enough. That's it's an understatement. It's an absolute understatement. I can never, can never thank him enough for what, for him giving me a chance. It know me from anybody. Um, and so that's why uh, when I talk about Gavin, it's like they, people just don't understand. Right. And then he believed in me, right. He really believed in me. He gave me opportunity. He let me do my thing as his assistant. And then, you know, we became friends and became, you know, our families became friends because my, my oldest son is the same age as hit their, their daughter. And so my wife and his wife, they would always be together. And, you know, so that's a whole other story. But from there, I mean, since then, it's just been it's been a whirlwind. I mean, I've coached in Jamaica. I scouted for a club in Holland. Uh, I was in Sacramento when we won the championship in 2014. I started the Sacramento Public Academy. I was one of the founding guys to start the Portland Timbers Academy. Um, wow. And, you know, I've coached numerous USL teams. And um, and then obviously a couple, you know, just last year, it's 22, yeah, so 21. Um, I got the job uh, at Stumptown, which... Uh, we had a good year, all things considered how things worked out. And then Chattanooga invited me and wanted me to come. And, you know, it's the best team in the league, biggest team in the league. And I jumped on it. It's been an unbelievable experience. Not just because the team's doing well, that's that does help, right? But because it's a great city, we're supported. Uh, the fans are great. Uh, good people to work with. Uh, and a good town. Chattanooga is a really nice town. So it's yeah. just been, it's it's been, you know, unbelievable. It's been fantastic. Hey everyone, Rev Brad here. Thanks for listening. Well, the whistle has blown on the first half of the interview as we conclude part two. I want to invite you back next week for part three, where Rod talks more about his time as head coach of Chattanooga FC. And we see where the journey that he's had of coaching leads him and what that means for his locker room. Well, tune in next week. See you then.